Um, all right, so as as I apparently struggled to just do, uh, you, can, you can you can tap your mic and, and tap it to turn off. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, there's a red light that goes on. That's how you know your mic's on. Obviously, it goes off when you tap it off. Uh, please tap it off when you finish speaking, because we can't have two mics on at the same time. All right, let's, with that, let's start with introductions uh, from the panel. Uh, but this is going to be interactive, so we want to you know, incorporate as many voices as we can from around the room. Uh, we are joined by Itai uh, Greenberg, the Chief Strategy Officer at Checkpoint, who's immediately to my right. Uh, uh, Suba Tatavarti, uh, who's the Chief Technology Officer at WIPRO, uh, who is next to him. And then uh, Rodrigo, Rodrigo Madanez, uh, Global AI Innovation Leader at EY. Um, and with that, I think we can, we can get started. Itai, I, I want to turn to you first. Um, and maybe you can, we can talk a little bit about you know, what we're seeing in terms of uh, the threat landscape, particularly over the last year, as we've seen this big generative AI boom. Has it changed the kind of attacks we're seeing? Have there, have there been things we've noticed? Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you for having me here. So hi, everyone. Um, so yes, I think that um, what happens over the last year is that the generative AI allowed us, or allowed the hackers, the threat actors, to produce uh, phishing campaigns way more accurate in a massive way. Now, phishing was a problem for, for many, many years and probably the number one problem for all those years. Uh, it's, it's, if you ask uh, CISOs, this is still a technology that uh, brings most of the attacks into your company. What happened with the, with, with the hackers is that they didn't speak English very well, so they produced emails that are not well crafted. They didn't know who they talked to, so they did it in a mass way that was not accurate. What they do right now is they can actually use generative AI to learn from social engineering about exactly what your job and what are you interested in at that moment because you posted something on LinkedIn, and they can craft an email that is very targeted only to you um, um, and you will be convinced. You will be convinced to open the document. You will be convinced to provide your credentials. Uh, and I've seen those kind of kind of attacks. And this is one example. I'll give another example: is is the ability, for example, to generate code. I can generate codes to do buffer overrun as a hackers. I can I can leverage machine learning. I can, for example, generate scripts inside my attached documents that will jailbreak into your shell command and do whatever it wants. So, so those are kind of examples it was hard for kiddie hackers to, to do before and becomes much easier nowadays with, with generative AI. Great. Uh, Suba, why don't we go to you? And, and what are you guys seeing? Um, you, you do a lot of IT uh, work for other folks. What are they saying to you about new security concerns they may have uh, as we've seen this whole generative AI revolution take hold? Okay, it's this okay. one. It's this one. Okay, awesome. Um, and it's a very good question because the way we are seeing this landscape evolve is in two dimensions. One is exactly what you just talked about, Itai, which is um, generative AI makes things easier for both the defenders and the attackers. Um, the, I, the biggest concern and the biggest positive is that the lack of fatigue, especially as you start to fine tune on accuracy or any other parameters, the lack of fatigue is great when you're using it for good, but lack of fatigue is also exactly the reason why it's dangerous for all the things that you mentioned, including DDoS attacks, right, and finding vulnerabilities. So that's one part of it. The second dimension that we're observing is the risk and security attacks within the LLMs landscape itself. The idea that you have transformer architecture applied to text data or other modalities that can generate X and Y output. But now the output itself, we don't know whether it is authentic, what is, there are different techniques now we know that are being used, like watermarking and others, but watermarking itself could be vulnerable. What is a key in watermarking as an example and how do you manage that key, especially when the content generated by LLM1 can then be morphed ever so slightly that can't be detected. However, if, even if you have watermarking and keys, the watermarking can be erased. So the idea is that there's two dimensions that we're looking at, and we are actually looking at uh, also addressing these two dimensions. One is you know, the idea around lack of fatigue, and the second is LLM themselves having that security paradigm and our need for discovering what those new security paradigms need to be. Great. Uh, 
Rodrigo, why don't we, we go to you? At EY, you're helping a lot of different clients on this. I'm sure you're also concerned about it internally, about how you know you protect uh, your data and, and the, the generative AI systems that you're using. Um, how are you thinking about this evolving threat sort of a landscape and attack surface? It was on. Uh, thank you, Jeremy. Um, so let me elevate a bit as to what, what I see our clients are at roughly. So I always try to level set and recognize that 2023 has been a very unusual year for doing generative AI. Most of the budgets for 2023 were baked in November 2022, when this wasn't even on anybody's radar. So everybody's carving out budget to do Gen AI work within this year. So it's, it's taken everybody by surprise and is moving unprecedented speed, but surprising. Um, I see most companies are, or the ones that I talk to, are trying to prioritize the risk trade-off in terms of moving fast. And in that risk trade-off of moving fast and deploying Gen AI, right now there's a lot of focus on doing pilots and particularly for internal use versus external use. So they're, they're, they're trying to be very guarded and safe. Um, um, just doing the heavy lifting of the compliance, the technology policies, putting all that in place within a year with limited budget that has been carved out is hard enough. I think we're only starting to see people realize now the attack vectors that are going to come into the agents that are exposed to the outside world. What shape are those going to have? What are going to be the commercial solutions they need to put in place? So I, I, don't, think the, I don't think we're there yet. Um, I think we're rushing to build those commercial solutions, assess them, and deploy them. That's probably going to be a work for 2024 than 2023. Um, it was interesting. It's like we were talking yesterday. I thought one thing you said was struck me, which is that in a lot of cases, in a lot of organizations, it's actually the, the CISO who is being given the responsibility by the CEO or the board. They're saying, you figure out what the policy should be about our use of generative AI because they know that there are these risks. And who's the guy who's looked after the cyber risk? Oh, it's the CISO, so we'll give it to him. But this is sort of outside their normal sphere of thinking. So they're being asked to take on this, this role that they haven't had before. And I'm also, I'm not sure, like, you know, if, if, if organizations, and maybe Rodrigo or, or, or Sue, we can get you in on this, if organizations really want to leverage this technology, does it make sense to have the CISO doing that job? Or is this sort of a, a a kind of a crazy default in some ways to say, we'll give it to the CISO because they, they can figure out what the policy should be on whether employees can use ChatGPT or something. Uh, right. Yeah, maybe you can speak to that. Further, the, the CISO role is, is evolving dramatically also as we move to the cloud and, and as we are uh, asking the CISO to rely on, on the developers, for example, in, in developing secure code. In, in the case of, uh, of AI, I think that what the CISO should think about is, first of all, which AI tools uh, the employees in the company are using. You need to have a discovery tool to tell you, okay, that there are so many tools that are approaching maybe a few different type of LLM behind the scenes, but there are, there are dozens or maybe hundreds of tools that they are using. What kind of data are they uploading to those tools? Uh, um, this is when you use public type of, of, uh, of, of generative data. And if you implement something internally, as, as I talked to Rodrigo, it, it's definitely a, a whole new thing that if I want to empower my consumers to use my AI, it, how do I secure my AI? Again, what's, how do I guard well the data that I put inside? How do I allow permissions to who can uh, uh, retrieve data and information from this AI? Because sometimes I will put information from multiple sources, sometimes from multiple customers, in, in order to, to train the, the system. So, so that's something that the CISO should and must understand and, and come up with a policy to, to deal with this. All right. Uh, Rodrigo, do you have a th thoughts on this or Suba? Um, so there's a couple of things in addition to what you just said. Um, so one is that um, the, I, I feel for the CISOs of today. Um, because just take simple examples like static code analysis tools. It was so easy. Now you're saying you have a code that might be generated by a slew of LLMs, um, even with watermarking. We don't know what the injection potentially is. There's a possibility of injection, vulnerability injection. The tools are not evolving at the same pace. You might have to develop LLMs or transformer based architecture models on other data sets to kind of cache that. The precision is not there yet. So there's a slew of all these issues that I think will start to emerge. So the idea is how do we get 
fast in terms of innovation on the CSO role is going to be very critical, I feel, because they may have to do their own innovation much faster outside of just relying what's out there in the market, because out there in the market may not be there ready in the next six months to a an year, and your attacks are coming right now. Um, yeah, I, I absolutely agree that the CISO role is incredibly challenging and evolving quickly. Um, I think right now what's happening is that they're enforcing the existing policies on data and protection, uh, but as they move into the realm of sort of shouldering the responsibility of um, protecting injection against the sort of conversational interfaces that are being deployed, that requires a different skill set, a different set of tools that haven't even been developed yet that are mostly homegrown right now. Um, so the, we can call it LLM injection, um, is going to be quite um, a key field coming up. Um, you should recognize that these conversational interfaces or LLMs are gonna be hooking up into all the internal systems in the back end, the customer systems, the ERP system. So protecting that entry point is going to be essential. Yeah, ab absolutely. I want to definitely get to, to questions from everybody in the room. Um, if you have a question, just if you can raise your hand. And um, there's one already right here. So we'll, we'll go to you first. If you could just uh, introduce yourself and, and ask your question. Or, or make a comment. We can kind of keep this interactive, too. Then we have OK. Uh, hi, my name is Ross Camp. I lead corporate communications at Commvault, which is a data security uh, data protection company. And my question is, uh, now that CISOs are, are being held criminally liable, um, but the role of the CISO has never been more important, are we worried about a shortage of CISOs because people are simply saying, there's no way in hell I would want that job? What, Rodrigo, what are we seeing? Are you, are you, are you passing that one? What do you, what do you think, Sue? Are you, are you getting asked to you know, have people sort of higher up the, the value chain, as it were, compared to traditionally you would have done sort of maybe lower level work, um, you know, uh, IT outsourcing, but are you being asked to take on sort of these higher level roles because there just isn't talent there? I will pivot the question and, and, and kind of address the situation. The situation is that the, the dangers are massive. I think that's that's the whole meta point here, right? Why would anyone be liable criminally, so to speak? And it's because of the da the risks are very very high. Um, and I think the idea that how we're approaching is how do we attack those risk factor vectors? How do we ensure that we are able to? In fact, the first time at Webro, we've 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 established an R&D team that's primarily focused on responsible AI in addition to many other things, as well as um, some of these other challenging areas that are emerging. Um, I, I, would, I, would, I would pivot it and saying, how are we making sure that we are attacking the source? Because individuals, yes, at some point, you know, the buck stops there, but, but, but it's more than that. And I think the education part is very important. Um, liability, I don't think, is the right, right answer. Um, I, I'm curious on that, not so much on CISO talent, where the specific liability issue may be holding people back from taking the role, but there's, there, you always hear people complain about the lack of, of sort of skilled cybersecurity talent sort of across the board. And I know that, you know, people are looking at potentially these LLM-based tools to assist in that. And, you know, Google had POMSEC, which they had trained. I don't know if anyone's used that in the room, but I'd be curious to get, you know, feedback on what people think um, of the potential is to use these tools as a, as a defense, mech, you know, to help with defense. Uh, it's, I don't know what, what your view is. True. So, um, and we'll come to you next. So, so I think that uh, there's a good promise with, uh, with LLM and Copilot to help uh, the CISO uh, and the cybersecurity teams today because uh, many, many jobs they do today to make sure that the policy is, uh, is, is in place. So they're coming with a policy, but then they need to execute this policy so, so LLM can go and, 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 and look for the policy and find mistakes and fix those mistakes and recommend how to fix those mistakes. Same goes for analyzing attacks. So I'm, I'm having a lot of a very sophisticated SOC environment, but it's very, very hard for me to understand how the attack actually went from, from the, f got into my organization and spread around my organization. Having a sophisticated LLM, generative AI, I can 
dramatically improve the, the ability for me to understand how everything works and to improve the way I'm doing things, also a, around best practices. So, so LLM can give me best practices, uh, seeing what I'm doing right now and recommending me how to improve uh, the security posture that I have in my environment. So, so this is a good promise that uh, I think uh, the CIS of today's can leverage from uh, AI-driven uh, cybersecurity tools. Great. Now let's let's go here because uh, you had a comment or a question. So comment slash question. There's Juan Orlandini, CTO at Insight. Um, I'm actually deeply concerned about these tools being able to be used for nefarious acts and being able to generate new attack vectors and creative uh, entry points into our environments. And at that point, you do have to have multi-layered uh, approaches to both the security and, oh, by the way, you do have to have a multi-layered recovery uh, capability because it's not a matter of if, it's when. And, and when it does happen, you have to be able to recover. So just commentary for you all. Um, other, other comments or, if, yeah, go ahead. Dorit or Checkpoint, I wanted to comment about the CISO role. Um, one of the speculation I heard is that the CISOs will split up between the operational role and the kind of regulatory uh, governance role. And they would kind of back off all, our, all the operational roles so that they could not have like conflict of duty, if you want. So we are kind of turning them into being like the police and not operating the security anymore in, in this trend. I'm not sure it's good for security, but great. Um, any other other questions or comments? I've got plenty of things I can ask, but I, I want to make sure we get everyone involved in the discussion. So please um, raise your hand if you if you have a comment or something you want to ask um, to everyone in the room. Um, basically, we not just the panelists. Um, great, go ahead. Hi, um, Melissa McSherry. I'm from Anywhere Real Estate, and I'm just curious if the panelists could talk about the sort of most unexpected or creative. Um, vector, uh, attack vector they've seen coming from a generative AI. Yeah, Itai, do you have a... I so, so if you open right now dark web, you will be able to find tools like uh, Warm GPT and Fraud GPT, which will allow you to generate those, those type of attacks in a very sophisticated way. Mm -hmm. You don't need to go... Obviously, if you'll go today to, to, to Microsoft, uh, uh, open AI GPT or, or Bart, you'll try to, to, to ask, uh, can, you, can you generate from me a phishing yeah. attack? I, 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 it will not allow you to do so. Yeah. The guard will, will prevent it say, on the prompt to do so, but go to the dark one and you can do so. There's another interesting thing that we've seen just lately, last week, that two type of, uh, of open AI, of generative AI, started to try to find vulnerability one with each other. And they actually did find vulnerability. Yeah. So you have, you have the prompt jailbreak. They, 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 one generative AI could break into the other generative AI on the prompt level. So mm -hmm. that was kind of interesting to see how they did it. That's cool. Yeah. Although I think that research there was, it was sometimes it was like 20 back and forth till they found something. So if you limited the number of turns of conversation, you could potentially prevent that from happening, which is kind of interesting, but yeah. Um, other, yeah, what, what, are, what are any views on sort of the, the attack surface and, and what we're seeing? Yeah, um, one thing that I real, I've seen, at least with some of our customers, is the DDoS attacks. Um, because it's become almost easy to kind of generate that kind of traffic. So that's one area. Um, uh, specifically on, on, obviously there's a lot of other research papers that I could code, but what we have observed that the DDoS attacks have, have gone, definitely gone up, yeah. Phishing email, yeah, oh yeah. WhatsApp, it, it's, it's amazing, like regardless of what media it is, like whether it is, um, on a phone chat, whether WhatsApp or um, or email, very, very, very realistic phishing attacks. I think, I, I, I think it's a combination of what you said also before. Um, the need of multi-layer of defense and secure in-depth. And, and, and I will touch base on, on what you said and what you said. So just last week, I've seen um, a, a very sophisticated attack coming to actually one of my employees. Um, and it was so specific. He's the VP Corporate Development in Checkpoint, and he got this email that was just for him. It was asked to put some username and password to open a document. You could easily be uh, doing so unless we had 
in, in our case, in Checkpoint, three different line of defense that one was on the link level that he clicks, one was in the browser that they had, and another one was the end network. So we took this type of attack and we analyzed it behind the scene to see what would happen if we pass the, the, the link level, it would have been caught by the, by the browser. What would have happened if this was not in, deployed in, not every company have those line of defense and it would have been caught by the network. So I think that it's important for us to understand that it's not one system, one product that can deal with this. We need to understand that in order for attacks to be spread and to be uh, um, uh, uh, finding themselves to, to many employees, we need to, to go with multi-line of defense. Yeah, uh, other comments or questions from, from folks? Um, one thing I was going to ask is, uh, you know, there's been a big debate about the use of open source LLMs, but of course then, you know, if you look at some of the security research that's come out, if, if you actually have access to the model weights, you can come up with very successful prompt injection attacks that sort of work on, and actually the interesting thing is that that some of those attacks also work on the proprietary models, even though they weren't trained using those weights. But I'm, I'm curious that, you know, what you guys feel uh, on the panel about potentially people using open source LLMs, because it does seem like it would, it would open you up potentially to uh, a, a, a number of prompt injection attacks that you might not have to worry about if you used a proprietary system. Okay, can we go first? Um, I'm a huge open source believer, by the way. Um, I have a bias. My career in the last um, several, well now decades, um, has uh, either uh, been, I've been part of teams that have open source or have used open source very, very heavily. Um, and I think um, that those vulnerabilities have always existed, regardless of its LLMs or not. What LLMs give, expose, or, or open up is that massive surface area, uh, which, which, which obviously was not the case earlier, and the lack of fatigue that was just talking about doing intelligent or seemingly intelligent tasks. So, so I don't think that it's, it's those, those risks always existed. I just believe that those risks have morphed, and I know for a fact that we will come out with better tools to kind of you know, scan those risks. Um, I, I'm a big believer open source. Yes, true, vulnerabilities exist, but we'll figure this out. Great, Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan Rivers, uh, CTO at Fortune. Uh, and first and foremost, I'm a huge open source zealot, much like you. You know, the internet would not exist uh, if it were not for for open source software. But I, I want to just chime in as a comment that open source is no more uh, vulnerable than closed source. And if you look at the Solar Flare hack. Right, upstream attacks are now a very real thing that attackers are looking at for threat vectors. So we shouldn't assume that OpenAI, Bing, Bard, or any of those other models are inherently safer as a result for being closed source. I think we're going to see an industry, and many of the of the cybersecurity companies will come for tools to secure uh, generative AIs, both on the data. Uh, on the API levels, which we talked uh, before, uh, on the way they are being deployed in the organization, I think we are still not there. Uh, we are still using legacy type of tools to protect our next generation of, of, of AI tools, uh, but it will come quite soon. Um, are there other questions or, or comments? Um, I, again, have, have ones that I can ask. Um, I'm Question uh, over uh, here. Oh, yeah, great. Yeah, I'm wondering what the panelists are seeing um, regarding uh, bo both voice and image as a way to uh, auth authenticate oneself. If you look over the past you know, decade, you've had a lot of banks adopting um, like voice authentication technologies. But now, you know, if I get a video of you, I could use a generative AI model to recreate whatever the past whatever the past phrase is using your voice and potentially access your account. So I'm just wondering if you see your customers, banks, financial services, no longer seeing voice as a long-term way to authenticate or whether you need voice plus something else and kind of implications for the future of that being a way to, to verify yourself. I have thoughts on So first of all, the whole deep fake is, is a huge concern right now, uh, both on voice and video. Uh, in my opinion, I don't think that we've seen good tools today that are dealing with this uh, in, in a good way. I think that uh, on the fraud uh, side, there are some companies that are specialized in, in doing those kind of things. Uh, we in Checkpoint, uh, even though that we are securing 
most of the largest financial organizations in the world, uh, all the transactions, everything that we do also on the syndication level, we're very much focusing on internet type of communication, which is text-based and, and type of API communication-based. We haven't spent enough on, on the voice level. And I think this is a new attack vector that was not here until recently. And, and, and I think many companies, including ourselves, will probably look into how to, to deal with this type of new type of attack. Yeah, uh, just commentary on that one, and this was is for my family's personal safety, um, because there's attacks that are now being perpetrated on individuals, not on corporations, right? And a ransom, hey, I got hijacked, I'm in a hospital, send me money, right? And deep fakes. So what I've been telling my family is, uh, you got to know a secret that only I would know, and you got to be holding in something that only you have, and that's how you can verify things: something that you know, something that you hold, and something that you hold. Mm -hmm. So something like a YubiKey or a two-factor or something or another, something that you know, something that you hold. So the best thing that I would recommend is stop using username and passwords. It's all single sign-on. You log in one time to your computer, and from this point on, yes. if someone asks you for username and password along the way, it's a problem. You get used to give your passwords, and this becomes your weakest point. You are used to give your passwords. Don't ask passwords. Your system should be single sign-on. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, are you, are you finding um, at EY, Rodrigo, are you, are you sort of trying to pilot some things internally uh, in terms of, of the use of gener AI, generative AI and cyber that you're then hoping to take to your, to your clients? Uh, the answer is yes. Um, both, you know, internally into our clients, what, what I'm seeing, I, I've, I've always get asked by clients, uh, where are we? Like they all want to know, are they behind and they're in the middle? Are they ahead of the curve? And what I keep telling people is that 2023 is about four things that are happening in Gen AI. Everybody's refreshing their AI strategy because in analyst calls, analysts are asking the CEO, what's your AI strategy? So that goes to the C-suite and the C-suite says, Here's what you know. Who's going to do it? Who's going to lead that? So there's some reorg happening as to how they're going to federate or centralize the AI. So strategy number two is everybody's figuring out what's their task force because this is so cross-cutting. Those task force have like legal, infosec, engineering, data, um, cyber, like, and, and they meet weekly and they sort of plot through it. So it's strategy, it's task force. They're all going through pilots. And they fi figured out that to do their pilots, everybody needs to go through this heavy lifting compliance exercise, making sure that all their policies are correct, that you know, the, the new tools they're bringing in place fulfill those policies with the policies need to be updated. So that's 2023. It's a year of the pilot where everything is being done. Um, I see this a lot internally. There are a few companies that are ahead of that. And this, this is more the industrials, financials, energy. The software companies are way ahead because this is their market and they're building all the tools to be able to sell it and do this at scale. But for the sort of bread and butter companies, um, they're all, we, we're doing that and we see all our clients going through those phases. Suba, are you sort of the same thing? Are you, what sort of trends are you seeing? Uh, trends in terms of generative AI adoption? Or uh, yeah, ad well, adoption, but particularly on cyber, are you seeing, you know, some interesting use cases with, with clients? Um, so I agree with one of the panelists yesterday who said, um, you know, most of uh, what we're seeing are pilots. Um, and 90% of what we're observing is pilots. But, 90 p but, but that's having said that, there's a lot of interest and there's a lot of interest in safety and safeguarding, which is quite interesting. Um, operationalized and productionalized use cases are primarily in the coding and the software development lifecycle. Uh, and on the other end of the spectrum, which is L1 and L0 operations. So these two are the spectrums, but then there is a massive interest from, a, from safeguarding perspective. Like what, what are the risks? What am I losing? How am I going to make sure that the accuracy is high as possible? Because we all know when you have a generic model, the accuracy is low, but you have a large you know, surface area in terms of use cases. But then if you are going to retrain or anchor or ground the LLM, it'll be more precise, but then that precision itself may not be enough. So there's a lot of concern around 
if I have adoption, then what are my um, what are my downsides to it? It's not really a security thing, but more about the risks part. Right. Um, yeah. Please raise your hands if if you have questions. If not, I'll keep keep on going. Um, yes. Can you talk please. a bit about. Uh, Um, so f financial services is very interesting um, because um, I worked for one for over a decade and um, we were known as a, not as a financial money movement company, but we were known as a risk company. What I'm trying to say with yes. that is every financial services company I know is risk first, fraud first. It's interesting that we categorize them as financial services, but that's what they do. And 90% of what they do is that. So, so with these, this explosive generative AI landscape, which the, the, I'm not using the right word, I think the surface area, to your point, has, yes. has, has completely exploded. In the past, it used to be X, and now it's X, it's not X plus Y, it's X squared or X cubed, yeah. right? So it's very different. Um, I think I, I would go back not on LLMs, but I would go back to the Transformer Architecture paper from 2018, which actually transformed how generative AI has built or it was used or the term came about, right? Because it was based on that Transformer Architecture being able to then be applied to massive amounts of data. In this case, it was text data because the text data was available the way it was available generically, and hence it became ChatGPT and everything else we know about LLMs. I think there is a massive opportunity to do the same on structured data, financial structured data, because, and I think there is an opportunity for us to accelerate from a defender's perspective, because attackers are doing the same. And the way, I, I think there is a massive opportunity for financial services, and whoever will take the lead in this space, we're not doing that, honestly. But financial services, whoever takes the lead on this space, will actually create a massive impact in the next three to five years. That's just my take. Specifically on use cases, I would suggest um, the, the, the ones that have always been traditionally around risk and fraud, I think that those will accelerate further. Um, uh, yeah. Jelly, go ahead. I'll add some stuff there. So um, I think the attack vectors you are mentioning, which are, let's say, Deep fakes, if you will. Deep fake synthetic identity. Synthetic identity, right? right? Well, social security number is correct, but then the address is Something different, is or the, the person passed away. So it's just very easy to put those together. Correct. That's going to be very challenging. I mean, if, if you think about it, that's both on, a, you know, know your customer in terms of creating new accounts, authentication with, you know, being able to fake voice, if you will, or video. Um, so. It, that's the risk side, you know, on the opportunity side is all the financial services, there's all these processes, back-end processes, which you can accelerate and do much more efficiently and augment the capability of your people. So I think we're only at the beginning of the journey. I think we're trying to race to create the tools to be able to prevent yeah. those risks yeah. from getting out of hand. I was wondering if you could, that's an, a case where you might be able to use it on the defense side as well. Right. I mean, I, I had a summer job where I worked at a bank and I worked in this department that audited mortgage applications and it literally went through, I was an intern, you know, like high school kid, but that they say, here, here's a whole pile of mortgage applications and you had to go through them and you'd look for discrepancies. And there was stuff like somebody, I remember, I want, out of thousands I looked at all summer, I caught one case of probable fraud where someone had applied in their in their parents it was a it was a junior and a and a senior situation but they had applied using 
you know, the na their name and some and the parents, I think, social security number. They had sort of mixed information in order to try to get through, um, and they had they'd gotten through. The loan had been approved, but I, you know, I flagged to somebody. But that's the sort of thing you could probably automate at scale using some AI technology, including LLMs that can read a lot of a natural language, and you might be able to catch some of those those cases of fraud maybe in in a way that you couldn't before. Certainly, when you're using humans to do it. I think when when you think also about fraud in this context. We need to look at Web3 and, and blockchain as well. And I think that right now what we've seen, what we've seen that in, for example, uh, 2022, uh, about uh, $4.5 billion have been stolen from, from the blockchain. So it's a huge amount of money. And the fraud move from the hackers are, are, are asking for, for, for cryptocurrency. Uh, this is how they actually doing the ransom. Uh, and, uh, and, and the money goes into the blockchain. And what we see that the attack starts in Web2, through phishing, through your cloud applications, they, 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 will, they will encrypt your data, they will ransom you, they will steal your money, they will take it into the blockchain, they will start uh, building uh, uh, campaigns of attacks on the blockchain and trying to get more money from smart contracts and alike. Uh, AI can play a significant role First of all, to cross the bridge between Web 2 and Web 3. And it can play a significant role in Web 3 to see how hackers are trying to take uh, uh, dirty money, dirty uh, money that they got from ransom, and to try to clean it up uh, by launching different type of, of, of blockchain level of uh, attack campaigns. And, and if we can see the intent of those hackers running different type of smart contracts that are trying to attack a di different other smart contracts, connecting the entire chain of attack, that's something that uh, with AI we can definitely do in understanding the big picture and, and, and stopping it early in the... In, in, in the Great, Terry. Uh, one more addition uh, on fraud and uh, technologies and AI. Sometimes it's worth looking at the opposite. So with AI, if you look at the white cases, you could get actually very high confidence on the good cases. So if you could attestate for things to be valid, it's not less valid than attestation for bad things. And sometimes we focus on IOCs, that are only the bad stuff. Uh, and with good stuff, you have an opportunity with technologies such as homomorphic encryption, uh, etc., to kind of ask in collaboration, kind of proof of facts, between organizations. So imagine if you could clear all the good guys and then kind of limit the exposure on the bad guys by clearing the good guys. So we always think, I just thought because it's a kind of an AI discussion, that is sometimes look worth looking at AI from the reverse opportunity technologically. I was, I was also, uh, I know we had a discussion yesterday a little bit about how, to the extent that uh, sort of attackers are using these technologies, it's actually very hard to tell at the moment, you know, uh, in any kind of evidence way, how much, you know, they're using this technology, if they're using it. I, I was wondering if uh, one way, uh, and I don't know if anyone's looked at this, it might be to look at the pricing of some of these, uh, you know, uh, hacker for hire kind of services, that I if they're actually using this technology, maybe they that price actually declines uh, over time, because it makes it easy. They don't need to actually hire people to do it. So uh, I don't know if anyone's looked at that, but that might be an interesting way to, to sort of see the impact of the technology. I'm assuming it will go down, but I think it will become easier, which is more important. I think that right yeah. now, very few people know how to generate an attack, so, so, so it's very limited. If, if you go and you open it up to have attack as a service, and everyone can go and, and say, okay, this is the company that I want to attack, um, um, go figure it out. And, and, and here is my credit card that I stole from someone and I can pay with this stolen credit card. Or here's a, a Bitcoin that uh, I got from a ransom attack and here I will pay for this, this attack as a service. Yes, the AI will go and say, okay, thank you. I don't need so much more information from you. I will look at LinkedIn and see all the employees. I will understand all the attack vectors. I know that this employee is using iPhone. I know that he has a private uh, e G a Gmail account. He has a corporate uh, Office 365 account. And I know where is, uh, that he has a Facebook account. I will find all the different attack vectors to go against this individual employee or all the employees in this company. You don't need to do anything. Just give me the money and I will do everything for you. So, so I don't know if th about the prices, whether they go up or, or down, but it becomes extremely easy. Yeah, interesting. Great, uh, here. 
uh, Sam Love with Invariant Bipartisan Government Relations Firm in, in D.C. Uh, so we haven't talked a lot about government um, and what the federal government is doing in this space. A few years ago, Congress spent a lot of time on cyber, you know, setting up CISA, DHS. Curious to hear from your perspective, you know, do they have the tools that they need? Are they focused on the right spaces? And are you collaborating with them or where? And if not, where, where should they be focused? Where should they be looking to? Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a good question. I know in the executive order that the Biden administration signed, there were uh, elements of that that had to do with data security. Um, so I don't know if anyone has comments on regulation. Um, so I've, I've, I've not necessarily interacted with many government officials except for representatives, representatives from DARPA of, in a few sessions. Um, what I did understand, and of course, um, we collaborate sig extensively with academia, um, part of what we do, both in the U.S. and in India. Um, I think what I'm beginning to realize, it's been a big aha moment for me. It's been a month ago uh, where I realized that everybody's trying to figure this out. Um, I remember this conversation with a CS professor from Stanford and exactly the head of CS department in IASC, which is the premier in research institute in India, and both had, and this was a ta lunch table conversation with a representative from governments from both countries, and, um, and, and, and almost the same sentiment, this was four months ago, five months ago now, the sentiment was, uh, we're sh surprised how, how reasoning is, uh, how, we, how, how it's displaying reasoning or that how eloquently code is being generated, because we always thought g code is logic and logic is reasoning, and hence reasoning is difficult for machines and blah, blah, blah. So, so what the aha moment for me was that I don't think any one of us have had the tools to really understand uh, the extent of what these machines can do. And we all remember this, I think it was step 36, or was it the move 36? I don't know if you remember the Go project from way back when, when it discovered a move that the model discovered a move that no human had discovered ever before, right? So the idea that the two models are attacking each other and what can come out is actually um, a very, very important logical CS step that I even academics are, are stumped. So the, my answer to that would be I don't think we really know yet. And what is concerning, at least when I take put on the citizen hat, is that the rate at which we are open sourcing and releasing these models without necessarily yet understanding everything that need to be understood. And when any scientist, any scientist in any field, when they don't understand a phenomena with reasoning and logic, it's always a little bit of a scary thing. So that's where I would, that's what I would say. I can tell you about specifically about GDPR, which yeah. says if, if, yeah. if I put the data, I can always ask to delete it. You cannot do it with with trained data that you put in in LLM. So, so I think I don't know how to solve this problem today. I think companies will have to come up with the solutions that that protect your privacy and protect your data, and and that's something that we do not have today. Can you clarify that that point again? The on GDPR regulation. The GDPR says that if I'm putting my data, yeah, in, delete it, I, I can ask data. to delete it yeah, with that's right. with. Right, and 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 yeah. every company have to that have business in Europe have to comply with yes. this. But with with uh, generative AI, if I'm training, especially public generative AI, if I'm training the data, but even with private, we use enterprise. Uh, if if I'm putting the data for multiple customers in order to understand and analyze yeah. and, and and see cross reference between what happened and to train the the the, the AI, there's no way for me to pull back the money uh, to to delete the data from uh, from from. For, for that belongs to a specific customer, no yeah. way. That's a big deal. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, I've, I've, yeah, I, I've written a little bit about this, and it's a, it's a huge area. There's no one's figured out how to, and also in the U.S., the FTC has talked about it's only used the power once, but it has the power if it wants to to mandate what's called algorithmic disgorgement. But no one knows how to do that with an LLM. You can't, like you said, you just can't take out. What does that mean? You can't disgorgement. Um, and But it basically would mean, if in a lot of cases, that you would have to retrain the entire system on all of the data from scratch without the bit that you're not supposed to have in there. But uh, And of course, nobody wants to do that. So everyone's got to try to figure out a way, how could you get a system to, you know, essentially forget an embedding, um, and it's not a solved problem. I would tell you that on a personal level, I wish to have a situation where I can go and say, if LLMs, especially the public LLMs, 
I will allow to scrap my personal data on the internet at all. Today, Facebook decides whether LLM is allowed to scrap my data or not. Today, Google, every, every, I don't have the powers to decide which LLM can look at my data. And, and I think that's, that's a big concern on, on, on for everyone. Yeah, I'll uh, cool. give you an example. Uh, I'm, oh, hang I'm, on, I'm I just want to get someone else in. Sorry. Sorry. We'll, get, we'll come back here in a sec. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so maybe starting with an anecdote, a couple of days ago, we were able to transfer $90,000 using Plaid within a minute. So I'm wondering if the vulnerabilities from partners are becoming even more important as you think about who you're actually allowing access to your system and access to your customers, and if that means that you're less likely to actually work with smaller startups because they don't have the same capabilities as larger companies when they're um, actually thinking about data security. And I, I'm with Bank Capital Ventures, so I'm on the startup side. Um, I, I have a, I in fact would bias towards startups, and here is why. Um, uh, you deal with probably more startups than I do. However, I've seen, at least from ones that I've seen, and we have a venture arm as well, um, startups have a very, very sharp focus on a problem area. Large companies, um, because of their business models, they tend to try to solve everything and anything, and sometimes they don't solve anything elegantly. So for us, I think startup gives us, startups gives us that access to a very sharp focus on a problem set and being able to influence how they solve for that problem set. And, and they're also more open to influencing how this go about the solution. So the areas that you're talking about, which is you know the data and governance and other things, we can very easily correct them. Um, but, but what we don't get when we start to work with sometimes mid-size and larger enterprises is that uh, the elegant solve, or a very different way of solving which is more efficient, or m better time to market, or whatever other metrics. Um, so that's, that's just, yeah. Uh, and I, I would just say, I know that um, one of the issues is right now you use LLMs primarily to generate some kind of content, right? So they're they're giving you text or they're retrieving data maybe with tied to something else. But what's clearly coming next is all the stuff around agency, and so you're going to be tied into all these systems, and it will actually have the power to, to to make transactions on your behalf through that system. And that, of course, again is like a huge attack surface potentially, right? I mean, it's something more you have to secure. Yeah, I think that, uh, uh, again, it's a very interesting discussion that I have uh, with Rodrigo before before we get into this room, is about today we are interacting with LLM to, uh, to get data, but we are not asking LLMs to actually do operations on our behalf. And I think this will be the next step of, of, of type of LLMs that we will ask them, you know, in the next week or so, I don't know, look for different type of stocks that are interested, and, and do the transactions, and they will do the interactions via APIs with the backend systems. And then Rodrigo uh, 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 came and said, you know, we will have to go and protect not only how we interact with LLM, but how LLMs interact with, with, with the system uh, on, uh, uh, that are connected to. And I think uh, that's, that was a very interesting uh, discussion we had. Yeah, yeah. yeah quickly, Rodrigo, because we have to wrap up, but yeah, go ahead. So, yeah. yeah, so you have to realize very soon what the systems that are being deployed, the LLM is becoming a conversational layer to all the technology assets in the back, whether it's your orders, your payment systems, your CRMs. So that is going to become a huge attack surface, which is what we were talking about. And that's where a lot of the cyber risk is going to come. It's not just the LLM, but protect. it's, a, it's going to be an open door. Yeah. Thank you, Jeremy. Well, that open door sounds kind of scary. I don't. <laughs> I hate to wrap up on a pessimistic note, but I hope I hope uh, LLMs also will help a little bit on, on the defense side. Um, that's all the time we have for today. I want to thank you all for coming. A big thank you to all our speakers, and of course to Checkpoint for hosting this session. Uh, we'll head over to lunch now, which starts at 1 p.m. sharp. See you all there.